Hey everybody, it's Jim Dunn from Oklahoma Wesleyan University and it's Good Friday. It's kind of an interesting statement that we make, isn't it, that this Friday is good and at the end of Holy Week when we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for the sins of the world, it, it wasn't very good for him. It was excruciating. It was painful and it's something that we need to remember. And so before you rush too quickly to the resurrection and Easter and, and the hope that we have in it, let the crucifixion of Jesus sink in today. I'm, I'm reading from Matthew chapter 27. It's, it's a long passage of scripture, but it's a powerful description of what was going on when Jesus was nailed to the cross for the sins of the world. And even though that first century seen didn't realize that that was what was happening they just thought they were kind of getting rid of a nuisance they the the leaders that that the message of the good news of Jesus was threatening and and maybe even threatening their livelihood and the manipulation that they had on people that Jesus was coming to set all people free that that message was very very difficult for the leaders of that culture and and literally was threatening them and and so they decided that they would look for a way and they finally found it where they could kill Jesus and do away hopefully with that message but I'm reading from Matthew 27 I'm starting in verse 11 and reading through the end of the chapter if you'd like to follow along or perhaps even read it later throughout the day and as you remember the crucifixion of Jesus, remember what it cost for the forgiveness of sin. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. And while Pilate, Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus the Messiah executed. Which one of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They answered him, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. 
as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is the king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him and shaking their heads, saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes back to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and, or James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate said. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. This is Matthew's account of the crucifixion on that first Good Friday. It's interesting to me to know that there are lots of us wondering when this virus will end as we celebrate Holy Week and Passion Week and the events leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we find that lots of things have been shut down or maybe even have perished in the midst of when we process everything. It's amazing how many things have been closed. Our campus is closed. Stores are closed. Uh, Whole states and countries are closed. And 
people are ordered to stay inside. I wonder what it was like on the first Good Friday to realize that what you had hoped for was now taken away. Th think about the disciples who, who gave up their careers and laid down their nets and, and followed Jesus. They, they became fishers of men instead of fishers of fish. And they'd given up three to three and a half years of their life to follow him around Galilee and, and had heard him teaching. And, and, and now they know that he's been killed. Th think about the women who came and even in this account to care for the needs of Christ and, and their belief and hope that, that he had placed in them even as outcasts in their culture, perhaps, and people who had very little esteem, that, that he had respected them and he had honored them while he was walking on the face of this earth. He, he had lifted their eyes to a new day and now he's gone. Think about Joseph of Arimathea, who this passage talks about where Jesus was buried in this tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had, had given for the body of Jesus to be buried in and, and a stone had been rolled in front of that tomb and, and then how the leaders uh, guarded it and, and put a signet ring kind of uh, stamp on it so that no one could defile that tomb. Think about those early followers of Jesus. This passage says that Joseph was a, an early disciple of Jesus and he trusted him. He put his hope in him, and it's gone. It's seemingly gone. And again, before you rush on to Easter morning and say, no, no, there's hope. But I want you to let the, the scene and the feelings, the emotion of Good Friday to, to sink in a little bit, to realize what had happened, to realize what it cost for Jesus to give his life for your sin and for mine. To think about the pain that he went through, to think about the flogging that he went through, to think about the fact that they, they nailed his, his hands and his feet to the cross. They, they didn't just tie his hands and feet to the cross. They, they nailed his hands and feet to the cross because that's what you do in the first century if you're crucifying the worst of the worst criminals. But, but Pilate, as we read, he, he didn't know what to do with him and even called him an innocent man, or at least Pilate's wife did. And, and the people just kept asking that he be crucified because they were stirred up by the leaders and the elders who wanted Jesus dead. Think about all of this scene where Jesus is spit on and mocked and, and beaten with a staff and and the crown of thorns that went on his head and, and how that had to have hurt. You, you know what it's like to, to be around a thorn bush perhaps and maybe you're trimming it this spring and helping around the house with chores if that's uh, a good application for you. But, but you know what a thorn feels like. You know that that hurts. Just imagine that being placed on your head. They kill the Messiah. And it wasn't some kind of easy death that he went through. I know nothing compares to that. At least I, I think I know nothing compares to that. I, I've never been through anything like that. I, I hope that you and I never have to go through something like that. But Jesus was willing to do it. He was willing to do it because although they were mocking him, calling him the king of the Jews, he wants to be king of our lives. He, he wants us to accept the fact that he did live and he did die. And in three days, he will rise again. And because he lives, we too can have life and life eternal. But I know that in this particular context, in this year that you feel like everything's shut down. Imagine what those early believers felt like. Everything's shut down. 
But I'm here to tell you, you cannot, you cannot shut down the power of God. You can't. You can try to, but you can't. You, you can't shut down all of life. You're, you're thriving where you're at, I hope. I, I know you may not see it that way, but, but even though there are things that have shut down around you, you still have the gift of life. You still have perhaps the gift of family. You still have the gift of friends. And you still have the gift of hope that can inspire you today, regardless of what it is that you're going through. I, I want you to reflect on the fact that as Jesus gives up his spirit, as he takes his last, last breath on the cross, as he dies, that the temple veil is torn in two from top to bottom. Some people think that veil was about the thickness of somebody's, somebody's fist. To be able to tear that and to be able to tear at its height from top to bottom, to think about the earthquake, to think about the darkness that came over the earth, to think about the power of God that was demonstrated even in nature during the death of Jesus Christ, where the centurion, the, the Roman guards, the, the hundreds of guards that would have been around that tomb looked at all of that. They, they looked at the graves being opened and people being raised from the dead, and, and nobody really knows what what that means, but there was great power demonstrated, the temple veil being torn in two and access to God being given to all perhaps and, and, and this scene of an earthquake and this scene of darkness and, and, and the earth rumbling underneath their feet. And, and they had to reflect at that moment watching Jesus die on the cross. And they said, they said, surely this is the Christ. Surely this is the Savior of the world. Surely this is the Son of God. And I want you to hang on to that today. There's a lot of stuff that's shut down around you, but you cannot. You cannot. You can try, but you cannot shut down the power of God. And so, on this Good Friday, would you allow the significance and the cruelty and the meaning of the cross that Jesus bore on Golgotha's hill at Calvary that he endured for you and for me and for all all who will believe that truly he is the son of god it's friday it's friday but sunday's coming it, things are kind of shut down right now but we'll return i think about the campus and, and miss you so much and i kind of see this as a long Good Friday, if you will. I know nothing compares to the crucifixion of Christ. I, I don't want to make that trite at all, but, but I think about missing you. I think about the quiet campus that when did I walk and pray for you. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Things will be back open again. The tomb will be open on Easter Sunday. And life will reopen for us after this virus runs its course. I just want you to hang on to it. It's Friday. And that's true. And we need to remember what that means. And we need to place our hope and offer, accept the offer of forgiveness that Jesus only can offer for our sins. And that he can save our souls. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. I hope you can hold on to that today. So, happy Good Friday and happy Resurrection Day.